Howdy, y'all. Hope you've been staying safe and staying healthy. Because fortunately for all of us, 2020 is coming to a close. This terrible, terrible year is finally over. We can at last say that. If you're listening to this, then pat yourself on the back. You made it this far. Here's hoping 2021 is, at the very least, a step in a better direction, no matter how small it may be. And here's to making it through that year too. With that being said, let's talk about today. Today, unfortunately for you, we're gonna be talking about Souls PvP. I have a question. Is any of this actually fun? Is any of this actually fun to play or are we all experiencing some sort of Stockholm Syndrome? Why am I asking this? Well, first, the story. If y'all are familiar with G9, he's a big Dark Souls 3 nerd. He came into his own through streams and content of Dark Souls 3 meta invasions. Primarily, he does meta level invasions at Post Pontiff and the Ringed City. And I'm sure you can imagine the kind of specimens he would encounter from constantly invading in these places. Just the best the game has to offer, I'm sure. But what makes him enjoyable to watch is a combination of him showcasing his skill while facing off against growing numbers of gankers, while also being able to succinctly commentate his own actions in the process. You can be simultaneously entertained and educated as you watch him beat ganks. But anyways, speaking of his commentary, one particular instance of his caught my attention and has been pestering at me for the past couple of weeks. There was this one stream he did where he was co-oping through a part of the Demon Souls remake with another player. At one point, they were invaded by a red, and unfortunately for the red, the two players cornered the invader up against a wall and proceeded to stunlock them to death. Laughing it off, G9 commented that invaders can't do much of anything when they're ganked like this, which he's right, but just a few moments later, he added on to the statement with how he wasn't going to take Demon Souls too seriously because of it. While Demon Souls was a neat change of pace from the monotony of Dark Souls 3, he also surmised that a majority of his viewers were going to be more interested in his Dark Souls 3 content than if he were to pursue Demon Souls more. And this got me thinking, what does it mean to take a Souls game seriously? How would we define the word seriously? Does taking a game seriously mean that you lean forward in your gaming chair and hone your gaming eyes in on the screen at any point during your playtime? Does taking a game seriously mean that you join a Discord server that talks nothing but that said Souls game for hours and days on end while you make Mugen Monkey builds in the off time that you're not playing the game? What does taking a game seriously mean for streamers like G9? Think of the content creators who might have to depend on their viewer counts and subscribers on a daily basis in order to make a sustainable income. A lot of ordinary folks either can't afford or can't even find a PS5 to play Demon Souls in the first place, resulting in a player base that is certainly going to be smaller than any game that was multi-platform before, like Dark Souls 3 for instance. I bet more than a few Souls tubers and streamers had to reconsider their priorities between either the old and wilting Soulsborne games that they've already been playing and the freshly painted but still old Souls game on a completely new console. So from henceforth in the video, we're actually going to divorce G9 from this original statement that he did. Because here's the question, why would you? take Demon Souls seriously when it has all of these quirks and hurdles about it. And to a certain extent, I'd agree with this premise, its face value. There are so many imbalanced qualities to this game, I would feel motivated to go back to play the other Souls games instead. You know, the Souls games that don't have low-level one-shot builds or that don't have infinite gank blenders or that don't have a stagnant meta weapon selection or that don't have latency issues. Oh, wait. I'm sorry. I lied earlier. That's all Souls games. All five 
games have enormous issues and they are not without fault. They are all rushed, half of the time broken, and most of the time inconsistent products born from both a lack of proper funding and a lack of development time. And yet, here we are, still playing them, talking about them, making and watching content for them. So the question remains, why do we play these games? Or more so, why do portions of our community decide to choose one of these games over any of the others? Is it because we find our favorite Souls game to be more balanced from all the others? Because we can definitely sit here and list the ways that these games do not reach any sense of the word. Viewers will vary on their experiences and grievances, but let's bring up some obvious issues from all the games. Have you seen how invaders throughout all of the games in the series can find numerous ways to either one-shot low-level hosts or just bully them to the fullest extent that that said game can allow? Have you seen how lopsided ganks can become when they either body block invasion spawn points or they mercilessly chase down solo invaders again and again and again throughout all of the games without fail? Have you seen how many players disconnect when they get invaded no matter which game you're invading in these days? Why hasn't the environment of these games provided enough incentive or motivation to keep these players in their world and at the very least attempting to fight and what about the imbalances of the individual metas revolving each and every game? Where's the variety when every Dark Souls 3 1v1 turns into a Pontiff Knight Curve Sword Ditto or a murky Hand Scythe Mirror? Oh, but let's not forget they might bust out a Ring Knight Straight Sword along with a crossbow with explosive bolts for a little flavor, huh? And what happens with the Dark Souls 2 arenas when they're filled with max leveled abominations all wearing jester's chests and who all have an offhand havel shield, soft swapping between pocket spells that they have while switching between a main hand ice rapier and a warp sword? What happens when you fight against a backpedaling, ninja flipping, high poise having demon spear in Dark Souls 1 who also happens to have a crystal great club hidden somewhere in their anal cavity? And what about the saw spears and the bone marrowed Evelyns of Bloodborne who never seem to stop pressing L2? What about the one shot backstabs into confirmed wake ups from the northern regalia of Demon Souls? And what about how, no matter which game you play, there is always going to be a thrusting sword and shield turtle build somewhere, anywhere, just waiting to do one attack and one attack alone? We could sit here all day and expose the absolute worst and unfun aspects of every game in Soulsborne until our sun supernovas. No game is safe from these criticisms. I think y'all understand that. But is that the point of PvP in these games? Is that the eventuality for all of us? For us to build up so much negativity, so many bad experiences that we stop having fun with these games at all? Because believe me, I've seen how jaded some folks can become. Some of us even forget the reason why we got into these games in the first place. Remember how the release of Dark Souls 3 PvP went, particularly with invasions? That first year, the likes of Ouroboro, Artstava, Albino, Inferno Plus, and others publishing their disdain for the state of the game's mechanics? They ended up buggering off to other games, to other ventures, leaving Dark Souls 3 behind. And it took years for other content creators to rise up from obscurity to show folks how diverse and fun Dark Souls 3 could be given enough patience, given enough skill, given enough time. Folks like G9, Saint Riot, Adam Barker, Chase, Revion, the list goes on. But now, even time has caught up with them. The dust is settling. The lifers of every game are starting to shuffle into hibernation. The hype of the Demon Souls remake fading and we as a community are beginning to dig our foxholes for the long, cold wait until Elden Ring finally reveals itself, whenever that happens. And all we apparently have to show for our waiting is our own vitriol for these games that we put so much time into. But don't get me wrong, the frustration is understandable. We've tussled in the same sandboxes for so long, the fire in us has more than burnt out, it's turned to ash. 
What love we could have has transformed to indifference and apathy. That indifference, though, is like a weed. It sprouts up whenever a streamer or a content creator plays any of the five aforementioned games, and the comments in the chat are so single-minded. Posting their negative thoughts with reckless abandon, absolutely dogpiling whatever game is on the screen. I've seen it. You've seen it. Saying how the games that they're playing is bad. Nearly every single time offering little to no nuance, only dead-end statements and asinine opinions. My biggest fear is that this dynamic, this growing loathing, is so deeply rooted in the psyche of the community at this point, that it will most certainly migrate over to when Elden Ring comes out. Because here's the question, will everyone like how Elden Ring turns out? Surely not. The game will not appeal to everybody. There will be game design decisions that will completely miss the mark for some. And that's fine. We all have different tastes, different expectations for how this game will turn out. Some players might end up saying that the game is simply not for them, and that will be par for the course. But what will be an issue, what will be a problem, is if the negativity carries over to the very fabric of the community, to the interactions within the player base. Will every player you meet in-game be as salty as the last? Will they disconnect whenever they think they're going to lose? Will the responses in the Twitch chats and the comments and the player messages all be filled with the same tired responses of how we ought to all be going back to play insert old Souls game here? Like what's happening when Demon Souls came out? Like what happened when Dark Souls Remastered came out? Like what happened when Dark Souls 3 came out? And when Bloodborne came out? Oh yes, let's go back to play Dark Souls 2. Where are the streams and the content for Dark Souls 2 these days, hmm? Where's the support for that game these days? Oh, you're gonna make a stream for Dark Souls 2. Do it! Do it right now! Don't just say that you're gonna do it, hmm? You see, I'm not saying that negativity will truly be gone. Negativity might truly never leave this community, especially when we're talking about capital G gamers and gaming in general. But my question is this, has the negativity of our community grown so large that it will dominate any and all talk about the new game that's coming? Will this negativity kill the fun of Elden Ring before it even has a chance to run? Now while I have this uneasy sense of foreboding, we're not going to get the answer to this question for the foreseeable future. So let's answer a question more within our grasp right now. Why do we find the other Souls games to be fun? None of the Souls games are properly balanced in the traditional sense, but there's still a strong following for each game, despite how low the numbers have gotten. If anything, this goes to show that Elden Ring doesn't have to be quote unquote balanced to be fun and appealing, especially when it comes to PvP, whatever the word balance means. But again, of all the wish list wants I could possibly have for this new game, I would hope that Elden Ring is a culmination of all the necessary lessons from the series' past mistakes, while also not forgetting about the highlights that made the previous game so special. From everything From Software has learned, I'd also hope that they'd be able to concoct something that is not only a clear upgrade from what's come before, but is something that we never knew we wanted. In a similar way to how Bloodborne was this ambitious spin-off to the Souls series, offering new mechanics like having an expanded moveset with transforming trick weapons. This is not to say that the Bloodborne PvP was even a fully baked as a concept, but it did enough to not only justify its existence, but it even left me and a huge chunk of the community wanting something similar. And while not all of us want a Bloodborne 2, I know we all would be greatly interested in a new game that had that kind of ambition. Speaking of highlighting the better parts of Souls PvP, let's talk about Dark Souls 2, what made it special for most players. It had a vast array of weapons and multiple movesets within each weapon class, not to mention the spells, not to mention this game had the most armor sets of any of the Souls games to date, the options, the fashion, the creativity. Furthermore, the way scaling and stats operated made it so that a huge number of builds were made possible. There was variety in every aspect of that game's combat. 
so long as you stayed out of the arenas and understood how soul memory worked, but it was there. That is undeniable. And then there's Dark Souls 3. For all the turmoil surrounding this game since launch to more recent times, right? One thing that this game did well was reintroduce the chaotic 4v2, 3v3 fights back into the invasion space like how the original Dark Souls did in the forest. But this time, modernizing the controls, most of the gameplay, to something that was not only fast, but easier to get into versus the older games. And speaking of the original Dark Souls, while sure the game's higher mechanics like toggle escaping and backstab escapes are not at all intuitive, they can still be learned by any and all players. And by learning these techniques, the fun can be found in that game, or at the very least appreciated for what it is. At last, we arrive to Demon Souls. Despite having an immensely impressive facelift, the game is, for the most part, the same 11-year-old game that folks played way back on the PlayStation 3. There are weapons and glitches that will frighten most players looking from the outside in. But I'm telling you now, give the game more time to receive more patches from Bluepoint. Give the community time to sort through the mess to find the gold within. And we will have just as fun of a game as we do with the other four. Believe me, I'm hoping for an Elden Ring that is a lot more polished and one that is a lot more well-rounded in the future than any game that has come before, but I'm just as equally hoping for a return of liveliness and positivity in the community itself. Not just when we talk about Elden Ring, but when we talk about any of the Soulsborne games. Because yes, all of them are imbalanced in their own ways, but that doesn't mean that they are not fun. And how would we know? unless we took the time to either learn more about them or recontextualize what we already knew about these games. We'd have to get more nuanced perspectives from different players, look up various guides from different sites, you know, actually sit down and listen and talk to and have a conversation with one another. But wait, there's more we have to do. We also have to consider taking time away from the games that have been preoccupying us for all these years. Have you seen it? Some of these games have potentially been altering our perceptions and inadvertently causing us grief for so long because we've been exposed to the worst scenes these games have to offer. I've seen it. Longtime players of all different games have been slowly but surely dropping their games after all this time. We just need a second to breathe in the middle of all this. Get some fresh air. If that means picking up some other game in the meantime, detoxing ourselves of the salt generated after years of the same old grind, that may just be for the best. Lord knows that that bad juju will carry over to Elden Ring's release. And I'm hoping, praying that we can avoid something like Dark Souls 3's release, where there were doomsayers as far as the eye could see where instead we have players taking their time to learn the ins and outs of the new game before reaching any kind of hysteria. This is assuming that Elden Ring comes out in a more finished state than any other game that FromSoft has made before. Sekiro has been the singular game in FromSoftware's recent lineup that has boasted the most stable launch with minimal performance and balance issues. There were a few rough edges, a few kinks here and there, but there were not huge, gaping issues like Bloodborne's connections, like the last half of Dark Souls 1, or Dark Souls 2's entire development cycle. I'm hoping that the player base, no matter who you are or what you do, can at least try and move the tendency and the attitude of the community towards something more productive, something friendlier. And how can we do that but with some simple questions that we ask ourselves? What makes Soulsborne fun for you? What brought you into these games and what made you stay for as long as you did? What are the better parts of these games that you enjoy and wish that Elden Ring had? Look introspectively. Think for a moment. When you highlight points like these, that enjoyment you feel, that happiness you express, will be contagious. Okay, wait. Maybe saying the word contagious right now is a tad inappropriate, but you get what I mean, right? What I mean is that other folks will have fun if they see you visibly having fun. Furthermore, if you attempt to show or explain to them why you're having fun in this way, 
you're at the very least giving them the opportunity to go to that next level and understand where you're coming from. And that's perhaps the most daunting task yet. How can one person, one nerd in one corner of the internet ever hope to turn the direction of a largely detached community? Because the main goal, for me at least, is ultimately to have a said community surrounding Elden Ring that's more proactive, more constructive, more cooperative, and more sincere in their actions than ever before. Some days it seems easy to just throw up the hands and throw in the towel, to walk away from these games and never look back. Because there are plenty of other games to play besides Souls, believe me, plenty of communities to trade yourself for as well. But maybe, just maybe, there is a chance, there is a way we can do a little good with what we have and where we are with these niche games and even nicher nerds. To both look back at the older games with a new perspective and approach Elden Ring with as open of a mind as we can allow. And if this sentiment was able to at least reach one person, I think we'd have made more progress than we did yesterday. No matter what happens, no matter what changes when the new year starts, if we're still playing the PvP of these games, we're gonna have to deal with each other one way or another. And we're gonna have to deal with our individual latencies too. That will never change, I guarantee you that. So at the very least, we can try and learn to be friendly, or learn to cope, or at the very least, learn how to use the block function. Anyways, that's about it for me. I've rambled on for long enough. If you have any thoughts to share from what I've mentioned, feel free to leave them. I'll try to read them all if I can. It's been a very crazy year, and if you have been following my work since now, I'd like to thank you from the bottom of my heart. Here's hoping for another year more of that. Also, if you've made it this far, I'll also be linking videos from a variety of underrated Souls creators who have either made informative or educational content from all five of the Soulsborne games. Hell, I'll even throw some Sekiro stuff in there too if you're interested. Check out the description. Please, give them a watch if you feel motivated to cultivate and curate more Souls content creators. There's some content out there that is vastly underviewed. Watch it if you can. But until the next time, I hope y'all have a good day and a good night. Happy New Year, y'all. Peace.